In this video, I will show you the implementation I've made um, of the log clearing buffer in a single header file that is uh, not using any CRT. It's uh, suitable for kernel and for um, low latency applications. So maybe interesting to see it. Um, this, is, this is what ring buffer is. So ring buffer is essentially an array. In this case, it is an array of eight elements. In this picture, I put them in two rows, um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just an array. And we, we have an algorithm to read and write to this um, array. So we have reader and writer. Usually, usually we call reader the consumer and we usually call the, the writer we call uh, producer. Um, in this implementation, I have four variables. It's called next read, next write, last read, last write. The next read, the blue one, is where the consumer is currently reading from. Uh, the red one, the next write, is where the producer is writing to at this moment. Now we have also last read and last write. So the green ones, the green cells in this diagram, are the spaces which have valid data in it, data that was written by the writer in the past. And the purple ones, these are the spots where writer can now write new data into because reader has already read all that data. The last of those is marked as last read. And the last of the green ones is marked as last write. It is necessary because um, the, the, the consumer will be reading all those green um, slots and it has to stop when it reaches last right slot. So it can still read the last right slot, but it cannot go any further until the writer progresses forward. And the same applies to writer. The writer can write until the last read slot and it cannot move any further until the reader moves forward. Now let's simulate that we moved by one position and we simulate that reader and writer moved at the same time. You can see that now the blue spot is one to the right and the red spot is one to the left. Um, yeah, so, so as we expect, we, we keep reading and writing uh, in, a, in a ring fashion. It's kind of like a cat chasing their own tail. Um, so this is what Ring Buffer is. This is my GitHub and there is a project called Logfree. You might have seen already the smart pointer, the Logfree smart pointer, and I have recorded a video about it, which you can also watch. And now there is also Logfree Ring Buffer there. Logfree Ring Buffer consists of one header file and one C file. We have this C file, which is an example and in this example, we have a producer and a consumer. And they are using this global array, GFU, as a ring buffer. And this global G ring B as a ring buffer control. So, so this G ring B is a control structure that will control where we write and where we read from. Ring buffer control structure consists of this last read, next read, next write, and last write. The producer thread and the consumer thread, they both allocate ring buffer position local stack variables. You can see here is the producer one, is the consumer one. And they use this to then synchronize the access to the ring buffer. The producer it's running a loop and in this loop it creates bursts of number of writes. You can see it's a loop inside of a loop. And I'm creating some data here. And what is important is I begin the write. So that's a transaction. I begin the write. I do the mem copy of that structure into the global array element pointed by what the begin write gave me. This is the index. And then the commit write will just release this slot saying this slot is now uh, available for reading. So if you look at the picture again, um, 
if we were writing to this slot, then, you know, after commit, this becomes green. This becomes last write, right? So the last write moves here. The consumer thread does similar thing. It begins the read. We receive the index. Um, we copy the data from this global array into our current local variable. And we commit the read. When we commit the read, this blue slot becomes purple. And the last read be moves to here. This is what happens when we commit. Our example program is running few few versions. One is single threaded. Single threaded version will do something like this. Write all those slots, then read all of those slots in a sequential way. You can see the code here. So it calls the producer and then it calls the consumer. The multi-threaded version will run those in parallel. You can see the multi-threaded version creates two threads and one of them runs consumer, one runs producer. You can see there is a sleep milliseconds parameter and I'm running this for different parameters to simulate different conditions. This will show you the how, how the ring buffer behaves when there is a race condition between consumer and producer. So the program is running. Um, it takes time because this was one whole second of waiting between the bursts. Uh, so the first we, we have this produce all the eight first, all the eight elements first, and then read all the eight first. So this is correct. Everything happened nice. No unexpected behaviors. Then we burst three items. Uh, the producer produces three items and goes to sleep for one second. And then produces another three items and goes to sleep for another three seconds. And goes to sleep for another second. And at the same time, the consumer will be reading all the time without sleeping. So you can see what happens when the sleep is one second. Here you can see what happens when the sleep is 100 milliseconds. And here you can see what happens when the sleep is 10 and 1 millisecond. There used to be more variation in the previous runs. I don't see much variation now. We can run again. Oh, there's a little bit more variation now in the second run. You can see there is some variation. The important fact is that the ring buffer control structure prevents data corruption. So it guarantees that slots are being written and read, you know, in a correct order in a ring fashion. Let's look at the implementation. Uh, this is the header. Um, so as we said before, the ring buffer consists of four integers. Next write, last write, next read, last read. And these are the ones depicted. These are those. And then we have a stream position, which is what we create on the local stack of each thread, which contains current position and a pointer to ring buffer. So this is this current position for the reading. And this is the current position for the writing. We have a constructor for the ring buffer. We have a constructor for the stream position. We have two functions, available write, available read and they calculate how many slots are available for writing and for reading. On this image, the number of slots available for reading will be one, two, three, four, five. The blue is included. The number of slots for writing will be one, two, three. So this is what this calculation is doing. It's calculating the number of those slots. Next, we have begin write and begin read. They are very similar functions. All they do, they, the begin write allocates next slot for writing. The so begin read grabs the next slot for reading. So the begin write makes this slot red. The next write becomes this slot. And the begin read makes this slot blue. The next read becomes this slot. Next, we wait. Next, we wait because um, if the number of available slots for writing is zero, then we cannot progress, we have to wait. 
we map the read stream position. So we're talking about situation when this stream position for writing already reached this place and the next next write would be this guy. And we need to wait until this stream position moves forward. And same applies for reading. In this case, we talk about situation where the stream position for reading reaches this last write and it cannot move any further. So this is why we spin wait until there is enough uh, either slots for writing or slots with data for reading. And then we have a commit, commit write and commit read. It uses compare exchange, interlocked compare exchange. We compare the value of the last write slot with what we think it should be. And if it is what we think it should be, we update it. So when it will happen that the last write position will not be what we think it should be? It will happen when we have multiple producer threads. This is supported and this is how we support it. The same applies to commit. We support multiple consumer threads and this is how we support it. We also support asynchronous operations. We support them by providing polling methods. This is poll begin write. It returns a position in the array that you'll be writing to, but you must not write until poll write ready returns true. So poll write ready needs to be uh, called in a loop and the loop needs to continue until this thing not returns true. Same applies for reading. We poll begin read. This returns an index in the array that we will be reading from, but we must not read anything from there until poll read ready returns true. So again, we need to spin loop until this function returns true. This supports uh, possibility that you will be spinning on multiple uh, ring buffers. So if one ring buffer is not ready yet for reading, maybe the other one is. So this is why this comes useful. You, this can um, be used to implement asynchronous coroutines in C++. We have here poll commit write and poll commit read. This supports um, deferred commit. We can read from multiple ring buffers, do something, and then commit all the, all the reads or writes at once. And that's it. That's all my um, ring buffer implementation. As you see, it's very simple. It consists of interlock compare exchange of long integer. Memory barrier. Memory barrier is necessary to ensure cache coherence between CPU cores. And also interlocked increment, which simply adds one to a variable in an interlocked fashion, in atomic fashion. Lock free ring buffer is very inefficient way of communicating between threads. There are better ways of synchronizing your communication between threads, like semaphore, for example, or conditional variable, or event in Windows. Why are they better? They're better because you are telling your intention to operating system, and operating system can handle it for you. So you're not taking control over all your computer. Instead, your process is nice to the system. But when we talk about low latency systems, real-time systems, systems that really depend on nanoseconds, um, you don't want to switch contexts. Switching contexts is very expensive. And, uh, you know, if you cannot do work on a single thread and perhaps, you know, the reason to use ring buffer is to pipeline the processing Right. In your pipeline, you shorten the um, average time of processing per, per item. On one, on one CPU core, you'll be processing the next item's first portion. On the second core, you'll be processing previous items, some portion. So you amortize it and the time, average time is of processing is shorter. You can process more items. You can also handle jitter. If the second processing, the time that it takes to process depends on the data and so on. So it adds an extra liability and also code is smaller because then the 
the, the process itself, you know, the, the, the thing you're running on this different course is, has limited amount of work to do. So it might be fitting in the cache, all the instructions might be fitting and the data that they need to work on. So yeah, so in very specific scenarios of the low latency, um, lock free ring buffer might be useful. How does it work? It's best when the whole ring buffer fits in the level three cache, because as you see from this picture, L3 cache is a mechanism where cores in one CPU package share data. If one of the cores is in the other CPU package, in the other CPU, then the ring buffer would have to be shared across CPUs over this bus here. You want to keep your sharing of your ring buffer within the level three cache. That's the fastest way of sharing between cores. But this sharing is, uh, you know, managed by built-in cache core inherency in your CPU. So that, that will give very good, you know, performance. Um, and that's all. That's uh, the ring buffer. Thank you for watching.